Welcome to Serious Business on NDTV. 30 minutes of hard business news. One topic, one speaker, and a conversation that's relevant to you. I'm Manvi Sinha Dhillan. I'm going to start the show today with some insights from a seasoned investor in tech startups. And here they are. One, well-funded companies in the non-listed space that are still burning cash to grow and not chasing profitability are only postponing the trouble. Two, these are actually good times to invest if you have a seven, eight, ten-year perspective. We're finding it easier. We find the valuations are lower, the round sizes are smaller, and we're being careful. Insight number three, a determined, dishonest founder will find his or her way around structures and frameworks, boards and committees. Four, always create situations of convergence of interest rather than a conflict of interest. And five, Preserving our capabilities in times of recession and not cutting back on investments too much has paid us rich dividends on three separate occasions, 2000, 2008, 2009, and again 2020. These are just five insights, but they're a window into how Sanjeev Bhikchandani thinks and how he's possibly acting right now. He's the founder and executive vice chairperson of InfoEdge India, one of the very few, if I may say so, profitable pure play internet companies. And today on Serious Business, we're going to leverage all his experience, from Zomato and Policy Bazaar to 99 Acres and Shiksha. Sanjeev Bhikchandani, thank you very much for joining us on NDTV. Pleasure to have you here. Thank you for inviting me. You know, I uh, have, I think, 20 points of starting this conversation. But I'm very clear today that I want to leverage everything that you've experienced, and I'm going to start with something that seemed contrary to popular opinion. You know, investing in startups right now. Would you invest in startups right now? We are currently investing in startups, and we have been doing so continuously for the last uh, 7, 8, 10 years, maybe 15 years. Uh, with some breaks in the middle, but not a break currently, simply because uh, we are seeing good opportunities, we are seeing good companies, good founders, good ideas, they're good new emerging technologies. Uh, and we believe over a seven, eight, ten year perspective, uh, you know, this is actually a good time to get in because we believe entry price, entry valuation matters a lot. So we invested in Zomato in 2010. Uh, right in the middle of the global financial crisis. We invested in Policy Bazaar in 2008, just before Lehman collapsed. Uh, and those have turned out thus far to be our two best investments. Uh, ICICI Venture invested in InfoEdge, uh, our first round, in um, April 2000, just when the dot-com bubble burst. And uh, we built Nokri through the crisis, uh, profitably after a couple of years. And ICICI Venture got a 28.5x return in six years. So I think some of the best and most profitable investments are made when the market is down. And that's your thought process right now. And I'm glad you mentioned Nokri. I should have mentioned that up front. Uh, you've said you're investing. This is a good time to invest. We've got a brief sense of why. But give us a kind of flavor of the opportunities that you're seeing right now. So our focus remains the same as earlier. Consumer internet, B2B SaaS, now AI deep tech. But right now, everything has got a flavor of AI. So, you know, AI is everywhere. Uh, but these are three or four areas we look at closely. When you say AI, and I think of your portfolio thus far, I mean, is it where AI sort of marries into the consumer space? What kind of companies I think that every, have an AI I orientation? Think every tech company. Uh, every internet company, every B2B SaaS company is now integrating elements of AI uh, into their platform, into their offering, uh, simply because AI makes things work better, work smarter. And if you had to, I don't know, make it real for us, give us uh, a sort of profile without disclosing too much of its, but you know, the kind of startups that uh, excite you today, uh, because Zomato, Policy Bazaar, Nokri, great innings, but I'm wondering today what kind of uh, companies, what, you know, what are the elements of these companies? So I tell you, we don't do it top down. We don't say, hey, this is a good sector, let's go for it. If we'd done that in 2010, we would never have invested in Zomato because there was no restaurant listing sector. We would not have done a Policy Bazaar in 2008 because there was no insurance comparison sector. We look at companies that are creating new categories, entrepreneurs, you know, breaking new ground, uh, and therefore we do it bottom up. We meet a thousand startups a quarter 
or at least look at a thousand quarters, thousand quarter, meet maybe about five hundred, uh, and we invest in three or four a quarter. Okay. Okay. Uh, and we start with first principles, bottom up. Is there some evidence of natural attraction? Is there some indication that the value proposition is so good that the customer will really want this? Are customers using it? Are they happy? Uh, are they coming back again and again? Is the company getting some sales? Right? Are, are customers paying real money for this? And is that real money higher than the cost? So that's the first thing. Then we look at the quality of the team and the founders. Right? And then maybe a hundred other things. But these two are absolutely important. Uh, very important also is, is there some IP that is being created or, or potentially can be created? Mm-hmm. Right? That matters. Because IP is what I think uh, gives superior margins, builds a moat, and provides longevity to a business. Right? Uh, so at Nokri we have built pretty serious IP. A lot of it is not known in the public, it's not talked about, but all our, our resume database is the largest in the country. Uh, the kind of algorithms we use to search our resume database are fairly unique to us. Right? Uh, in the company, we've got a, you know, an AI, ML, and this team in excess of 40 or 50 people, which is one of the largest for an Indian internet company you know, in this country. We believe that gives us a serious edge. Now, I'll tell you something. I'll give you a little story hmm. of something that uh, we did about maybe 15 years ago. At that time, we, we didn't know we were doing AI. It just looked like a smart algorithm. Now, it'll probably be classified as AI. Okay? Or borderline AI, right? Uh, so, at Nokri, we've got 80 million resumes. Recruitment managers come, log in, and they search this database of resumes to try and identify candidates they want to contact to hire them. Now, because the 80 million resumes, we have a problem of plenty. So, the HR manager, the recruitment manager, puts in some criteria. They say B, B Tech Computer Science qualification, uh, three to five years experience, and keywords Java, C++, mm-hmm. right? Location Bangalore, right? He puts these in the structured fields, and maybe 500,000 matches are found. Now, there are many, many, many unarticulated criteria which uh, the recruitment manager cannot uh, put in the form. But the moment he sees the CV, he says, yes, no basis, judgment. So we, uh, and therefore what used to happen was that in the first page of the finds, he'd find two relevant resumes, although they all matched the criteria he put down. Page two and three, nothing. Page five, three more. And so it would take him about 100 pages to get 50 good resumes. That would take him maybe half an hour to 45 minutes. Right? And we said, is there a way we can identify these unarticulated criteria? and somehow put all the relevant ones at the top on the first page. If you can, you can save about a half an hour of your client's time. While and you managed to do that successfully? Yes, we, 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 we developed an algorithm, it was a couple of years. Uh, we developed an algorithm that did precisely that. And it worked like a miracle because uh, you know, only five people in the company knew how it worked. And the moment we introduced it, uh, you know, uh, our sales team all got calls from clients saying, what is this, what have we done, this is fantastic. Right now, that's how smart programming, uh, AI, ML can help you. And proprietary. And proprietary. And that's uh, one of the sort of defining uh, criteria that you're looking for. Which now brings me to this larger question: If you had to distill the wisdom gained over all these years of investing, uh, I I shared five insights. And I'm going to urge you to articulate your wisdom differently. But if there were three things that sort of have become the pillars of the way you approach investments, what top three things come to your mind? I think the first thing is uh, one very important question. Uh, So I, but I asked Dipinder Goel first time I met him. So the thing, uh, Zomato was then called Food eBay, right? And uh, I used to visit the site regularly uh, because uh, it was the only restaurant listing site with all the menu cards. Right? And I found it very useful. Hitesh Oberoi, our CEO, also found it useful. And we discussed one day, and he said, why don't you look at it for investment? And I said, yeah, why not? And I reached out to Dipinder. I didn't know him. I did a Google search to find him, and I sent him an email. And he came and met me, and the first question I asked him, yeah, Dipinder, the idea can't say, where did you get this idea from? And he said, look, I was working in Bain Consulting. Right? And uh, it was a 
in Gurgaon. It was an office with maybe 50 or 60 people, uh, mostly young, mostly single, mostly male, many living away from their hometowns. What it meant was they wouldn't get food from home for lunch. And consulting hours were long, so you ended up, you know, maybe uh, having two meals in the office, lunch and dinner. And office had a cafeteria which would not serve food, but you could get your own food and eat it. So to make life easy for the employees, the admin team had uh, collected all the menu, menu cards of all restaurants that deliver there. Yeah. And so, uh, and Dipinder said, you know, it is a huge pain every day, 1 p.m., I go to the cafeteria, I have to wait in a line to access the file because everybody's coming at 1 o'clock. And then I get it for three and a half minutes, then I go to decide very quickly, I ring up the restaurant, I place my order, and uh, then I come back after 45 minutes when it's delivered, and then I pay and I eat. Mm. Huge pain. She says, one Sunday I came into office and I scanned all those menu cards and put those pages up. Uh, on, in my, an internet. On, on my on my personal page on the office internet and two days later the IT infra guy came to me <laughs> and said why is all the internal traffic going to your page <laughs> and and that's when the penny dropped and I realized that uh, aggregation of menu cards has got value yeah and that is what gave him the idea for doing what he did uh, now to me this is a big deal that uh, he has built his fundamental value proposition on what we call a deep customer insight, right? Uh, and I think that makes a big difference. That's a very important question we ask. Another important question we ask is, okay, after, so we are very often the first check into the company. Yes. And uh, so the guy has not been taking salary for a while, right? He's probably qualified, probably wasn't a good job sometimes, could have been earning a lot more. His batchmates earning a lot more and he's been out of salary for maybe a year or two. Yes. So then we ask him uh, or her, what kind of uh, salary would you like to pay yourself uh, after we invest? Now, we are not interested in the specific answer. Right? We are more interested in how the person approaches the answer, how he thinks it through. So I've had people who said, um, you know, uh, we did an MBA five years ago. We've been not without a salary for a year. Our batchmates are earning so much in industry, so we have to get at least that one a little bit more to make up for the one year. That's one kind of answer. Another guy gave an answer, which is, you know, I'm in this job. I will quit the job if you give me money. I'm getting X in the job. I want 30% more because I'm taking a risk. There's a third kind of answer, which is, listen, uh, you know, I will, uh, I have some savings. Uh, I need X amount to survive. That's usually not very high. Uh, maybe a little bit more to get some comfort. But I don't want to take too much right now because I will then run out of money faster and I will... Uh, then, the growth of the company. I will then have to raise more money and that will dilute me more. I don't want to dilute too much. And that's the right answer? Well, there are three different answers. They tell you three different uh, mindsets. But which one would you back? Well, the third one obviously is you know yeah. somebody who will work for the company and uh, will ensure the company grows big and profitable uh, and he will not dip into the till until the company is profitable. Which brings me to this issue of governance and I'll tell you sitting on the outside I keep wondering what is it about the governance lapses that we've seen in recent times that have been al allowed to escalate in the Indian startup universe and we're not getting into specifics here but you have boards and you have hefty investors and you think there's a lot of wisdom sitting around the table and yet these things happen. Um, why? I think, I think very simply, uh, when investors go in, uh, they diligence the company, they diligence the founder uh, and they conclude that the founder is honest and trustworthy. Right? And that is the case with 95%. Of the, of the situations. Most Indian founders are uh, trustworthy and honest. Right? But there are maybe two, three, four, five percent who perhaps uh, are not that clean. Right? And those are the cases uh, that have got highlighted actually. And now, now having said that, having said that, I think a lot will depend on what actions investor takes, investors take after they discover this. And you certainly can't let things be. That's not a good idea in my view. 
is there a medical, middle sort of category of governance lapses which is you know chasing growth at the cost of um strong processes i mean i'm trying to understand if there's a redeeming no, you, type of mistake or governance you, you can no so you can make mistakes of business judgment right those are honest mistakes but stuff where you have been taking money out of the company yes taking kickbacks i mean that's on an integrity issue so really when you're talking governance lapses uh, the big ones are where there's an integrity issue right if there's a process lapse here or a process lapse there you know you'll say okay fix it make sure it doesn't happen again or just not scaling up checks and balances to match the you know the growth I mean that's also a type of governance lapse that is a governance lapse but that is not an integrity lapse right you got to distinguish between integrity lapses and other lapses and so how would you sort of sum up uh you know what you're looking for in terms of governance today as you navigate uh startup investing so i think uh, a few honest conversations and a buy in on both sides on what is okay and what is not okay up front is generally a good idea so i'll tell you we raised money from icici venture right uh in april 2000 by april 8th by 20th april they had told us okay we want a big five auditor not that they suspected anything that they, was their process that is a bit look i mean you know we've given you x amount of money that was 7.3 crores which uh, you know by today standards not a lot but then was quite a bit uh, and said you know we need uh, a good auditor right and uh, and we don't care what it costs but it has to be done right number one number two they said we want a full time cfo yeah a qualified full time and not somebody who's one of the promoters or related to the promoters but independent mm. right Number three, we would need an independent director, maybe in about six, eight months' time. Number four, we would need an internal auditor. So these four structural things they asked for almost immediately, on a path of about eight, ten, twelve months, we'll do all this, right? Uh, number one. Number two, they said some guiding principles. Uh, number one, uh, you can't get rich on our money. Okay. so we decide your salary you don't decide your own salary and your salary will be something that's agreed you can survive but you can't get rich on it number 1 number 2 they said you can't get rich till we get rich okay so you can't sell any shares without our permission because the valuation you've got is not real the valuation you've got is based on some future prospect of company performance if the company doesn't deliver to that that expectation then the valuation is too high but therefore you can't sell at a valuation right now okay you have to deliver then we all sell together if you want okay Those okay so so there's some and they're very interesting insights that you're sharing out here because you can distill them into the kind of approach that always make sense it did back then and it makes sense now when you're navigating investing in the startup environment in india or anywhere else we're taking a break on serious business back in a moment with sanjeev big chandani of infoedge what you're missing on the inside is waiting for you out there Find the missing piece of your puzzle. Write the missing part of your story. The new safari. Reclaim your life. When some of India's top cities, such as Delhi, NCR, and Mumbai, are battling air pollution, are the buildings and office spaces that we spend one third of our lives in any better? The biggest um, uh, effect, Manisha, of poor air quality is loss in productivity. A lot of focus on uh, air filtration. The right uh, air filtration, uh, you can uh, actually 
uh, capture a lot of uh, clean air. We're trying to even provide health as a service now to our uh, tenants. Right. बनेगा स्वस्थ इंडिया के इस खास कार्यक्रम में हमारे साथ बच्चे मौजूद हैं और साथ में आचीज का कास्ट है ये हम सब जानते हैं कि इन्वायरमेंट बहुत ही इम्पोर्टेंट है कि हम इन्वायरमेंट का देखभाल करें क्योंकि दिस इज द वन प्लेनेट वी हैव आलिया भट्ट ने अपना वेडिंग सारी नेशनल अवार्ड रिसीव करते हुए फिर से पहना वेरी मच नीडेड मैसेज भारत में महिलाओं की केवल भागीदारी नहीं बढ़ी है बल्कि वो हर क्षेत्र में आगे आकर नेतृत्व तो कर रही है आधी आबादी की आर्थिक आजादी यानी सबल नारी प्रगति हमारी बीसी सखी कार्यक्रम से आत्मनिर्भर बन रही है प्रदेश की नारी सभी अट्ठावन हजार ग्राम पंचायतों में नियुक्ति 10 लाख सेल्फ हेल्प ग्रुप से 1 करोड़ महिलाएं जुड़ी पोषाहार निर्माण इकाइयों से 4 हजार महिलाओं को प्रत्यक्ष रोजगार 2 लाख पैंतीस हजार स्वयं सहायता ग्रुप्स को दो हजार करोड़ रुपए के ऋण उपलब्ध 31 लाख पचास हजार महिलाओं को निराश्रित महिला पेंशन मिली सपने हो रहे साकार डबल इंजन की सरकार Welcome back to Serious Business on NDTV. We are in conversation today with Sanjeev Bhikchandani, founder and executive vice chairperson of InfoEdge India, that took an early bet on companies like uh, Zomato and Nurtured Policy Bazaar. Uh, thanks uh, very much again uh, for being on NDTV. But today, uh, our focus now on higher education because perhaps not enough people know of the uh, critical role that you played in the creation of Ashoka University and I want to talk a little bit about higher education in India because Ashoka University certainly most or all will agree that it's been a success so if you look at the ingredients of that success what worked it was a you know uh, a new bet in a sense so I think uh we started with a few sort of guiding principles uh, the group of us who came together and we said first thing is uh, we will do liberal arts and sciences and not typically engineering or management first because uh, those are solved problems we want to do a model and attack a problem which needs solving and we felt that liberal arts and sciences had not been addressed by private uh, higher education institutions um adequately so one was that's a focus area because there's a gap there a need gap second we said we will not follow the uk system which is prevalent in india which is you choose a subject and you study it that's it uh how the us system where in your first two years you do breadth and width which is you study many subjects and then you declare a major at the end of second year you know in india our subjects and majors are decided by our class 12 marks indeed and not by what we want to do exactly right uh, and we said we want to change that so that's the second thing that is changing right the third is we said we do collective philanthropy we will it will not be one person's or one family's or one business house's university mm. uh because if you have collect so no matter how much a person donates he or she or that and or that business house will only have one seat on the board so i could donate 25 times what uh, the smallest donor has given but we both have the same single seat on the board because we felt that that is what will ensure the independence of the university and uh, the academicians and the uh, and the and, and the program uh, and it will not be sort of subject to the the decisions of just one person and that is what ensures the universities independence and that also ensures academic freedom and independence at ashoka that there isn't one person who decides and would you i use the word success i have children who are college going so i know what the demand for ashoka university is but do you consider it a success have you been able to achieve what you set out to achieve i think very substantially Uh, not wholly but very substantially but you know uh, there's always room for improvement and so where we, are the gaps i think the the gaps are in uh, first of all we wanted to do a four year program 
uh, but we were not uh, initially uh, the UGC said that you can't do a four-year BA it has to be a three-year BA so we had to tweak the program now uh, we are doing a four-year program because now it's been permitted uh, so I think we overcome that bit right uh, I think uh, to some extent look we are pioneers in uh, Rajiv Gandhi Edu City at Konli right in Sonipat district yes so we're kind of away from the city so we've got to be a self-contained kind of uh, operation where everything is inside the, the the four walls of Ashoka and you have to provide options to students. And to uh, teachers because you want to attract the best. Yes, teachers, but you know, so enough teachers live in Delhi and commute. Mm. Uh, but yes, you're right. I mean, we want to actually have more and more teachers staying on campus 24-7. Mm. Uh, we also want it to be, uh, you know, we've but we've done a few things right. We've insisted on fully residential. There are no day scholars. It's a 100% immersive experience, right? We've uh, provided a lot of width, uh, large number of extracurricular activities. Uh, we've provided a decent campus, and now we've we started with 25 acres. Now we've got close to 100 acres, and we're expanding there. Right? We have uh, diversified into science, added science, which was always the plan, and uh, the school of entrepreneurship, which was there from the beginning, but has now expanded substantially. And what about the social and demographic diversity? Uh, roughly 60% of Ashoka students uh, are on some form of financial aid or the other from 25 percent to maybe 100 percent right uh, and that enables us to uh, be more financially inclusive one final question would this same group look at replicating ashoka the same group would not but we want to be copied. You see, one of the earlier aspirations when I said seven, eight, ten guiding principles, one of them was, see, see in India, if you, India's got 1.4 billion people, right? India can do with 100 Ashokas. Absolutely, which yeah. is why I asked that question. Yeah, so, so, yeah. so we said we'll do one, we'll make it work. If you make it work, uh, you know, uh, we will get copied. And, and we will encourage others to copy us. So we will open our doors to being copied, right? Uh, and so we, you're mentoring well, anyone uh, who asks? Uh, we, we, anyone who asks, we tell them what we're doing and how we do it and we give them a guided tour. So, I'll, you know, and so, so there are several sort of universities which have uh, either launched or have launched liberal arts programs and they've spoken to us before launching and we have been open. Some of them have taken our faculty also, right? Uh, and, and, uh, and that's fine because, uh, you see, we had one thing very quickly. We understood one thing early on, that if something works in India, it gets copied. Yeah. So the government created five IITs, now there are three or four thousand engineering colleges. Yeah. The government created three IIMs, now there are three thousand men in schools. Yeah. If it works, it gets copied. So we knew if you make one work, others will join. And that's fine. So, it, so the concept of Ashoka will scale. Ashoka will scale to maybe seven, eight thousand students, but not eighty thousand students. Well, when I started this conversation, I said there are 20 starting points. Now that I'm ending this conversation, I'm, I will tell you honestly, Sanjeev Bhikchandani, I feel like I could touch another 10 topics with you. We're going to have to leave it for another time, and I hope you make that time for us. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Thank for you for joining us on NDTV. Thank you.